In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In every culture, among every people who have ever lived, there is a sense of the sacred. There is a realization that some things, some places, and even some people are different. They're set apart. They're dedicated to a particular purpose. They're not common to be used as everyday items or handled or tread upon as people would other items or places in their day-to-day lives. And this is shown in the way that we treat things. In our faith, this is seen in the way in which we do and treat things in the divine service. The space here in our sanctuary is honored and adorned in ways that we would not treat our offices or even our homes. The vessels used in the Lord's Supper are not used as we would use other utensils, cups, or dishes. The words that we speak and sing and chant in this service are elevated through music and through unique usage to mark them as different than the words of our day-to-day business-as-usual conversations. There's a distinction between what's sacred and what's common, what's set apart for holy use and what's used in everyday life. Now, the handling of holy things is a great gift. The Lord has placed these set-apart gifts into our hands so that we may use them as they're meant to be used. But there's also a danger to handling holy things. All too often, we get too used to them. We forget what it is that we're touching, what we're saying, what we're hearing. But where we're standing, we lose that sense of the holy, the set apart. Now, many have lamented that today there's nothing sacred. And we would have to concur that there's something missing in how people are able to distinguish the holy from the common. Of course, that's nothing new. That sense was lost in our gospel reading that we heard today about the merchants and money changers in the temple. What they were doing was necessary, yes, to everyday life. Pilgrims to Jerusalem needed to exchange their own currency so that they could pay the temple tax in the coinage that was demanded. And those coming to the temple to sacrifice needed to obtain the animals that were going to be offered. It was business. What they were doing was necessary, as most of our common, everyday interactions are. But the problem was that these things were being done inappropriately in a sacred space. They had become too familiar with the holy precincts of the temple courts, and they had lost that distinction of the sacred. They had forgotten about the holiness of that sacred space. Now, the holiness of the temple came from God's own holiness. He had promised his people that he would set his name upon the place of his choosing, and there on Mount Zion he caused his name to rest. He filled that space with the majestic cloud of his presence, so thick that no one could enter it as it was being dedicated under King Solomon. The Lord had vowed to be present there in all of his holiness to make that place like no place on earth. A place where he would sit enthroned over the cherubim, over the Ark of the Covenant. A place where he would graciously visit his people and distribute forgiveness and life to them through the sacrifices offered there. They would hear his word and decrees and they would know that he is the Lord. God's holy presence would make that place holy, that temple, and those who came into contact with it would also be made holy through the gifts that he offered there. 
But as mankind so often does, men traded the holiness of God for things that are not holy. The ancient Israelites saw the temple's location in Jerusalem as too inconvenient to get there for the important feasts, and so they established alternate sites, often found where the false gods of the nations before them had been worshipped, and so they traded the holiness of the temple for those common places filled with mute rocks and trees. They lost their sense of the sacred, trading what God had given them for something that they thought would be better, or, at least, more convenient. And the merchants and money changers in the temple had also lost their sense of the holy. They turned the house of God into a house of trade, making the outer courts of that sacred place into little more than a market, which could be found practically anywhere. Again, it was out of convenience for the ease of those coming to the temple, and it offered a little bit of profit as well. But once again, mankind traded the holy for the common, the gifts of God for the everyday crumbs of the world. And what of us? Do we not do this as well? Are we not all too willing to trade what's sacred for what's common? How many times have you longed for something that's a little bit more in line with what the world says would be good? How often have you rolled your eyes or glanced at your watch or sighed over some gift of God simply because it inconveniences you or it makes some demand on your time or energy? Time and energy, by the way, that you're all too willing to offer to almost any other preoccupation or pastime. Do you not also simply mouth the words, forgetting how holy they are, thinking of everything except for what you're saying? Have you, like the money changers, forgotten that you stand on holy ground, the place where God himself comes to meet you in his body and blood, bestowing forgiveness and eternal life right here in this place, through these words, in these gifts. We are no better than the merchants or money changers, no better than the ancient Israelites. We like to imagine that we also can construct our own holiness, We also exchange what's sacred for what's common. We also turn our back on what God has given us as holy, preferring things that aren't. And in the process, we make ourselves common and profane. Now, Jesus knows that this is a problem that strikes every last child of Adam and Eve who themselves traded what was good and holy for something else when they laid aside God's word in favor of the tempter's half-truths. And so, Jesus has a solution. Jesus gives you his holiness in place of your unholiness. He bestows it upon you. He's the one who makes things holy, and so he's bound and determined to do it. Now, he proves this with, our word, with his words in our reading this morning. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, pay close attention. That's not an if statement. It's not conditional. It's not hypothetical. He doesn't say, if you destroy this temple. No, he's saying, go ahead. You're going to destroy it. You're hell-bent on getting rid of what's holy. You're going to tear it down. Go ahead. I'll still raise it back up. I'll still bring holiness. I'll still be able to make sacred things sacred. St. John explains to us how this is done. It's done with Jesus' death 
and resurrection. He tells us that Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Now with the tearing down and raising up of that temple, the temple of Jesus' body, Jesus restores what's sacred. He gives holiness to those who have made themselves unholy and common. Now that means that Jesus died for the money changers and the merchants in the temple. He died for the leaders who challenged his authority after he cleansed the temple. He died for the Israelites who shrugged and turned their backs on the holiness of the temple in Jerusalem. He died for those who violated the holiness of God's Ten Commandments. He died for you. Jesus shares his holiness with you. He makes you sacred. That means that he makes you into a temple. Even after you've wrecked your holiness, when you've become common and profane, when you've torn down everything sacred about your life, he still raises you up just as he was raised up. He absorbs your unholiness in his own teardown on the cross. And it's there that he builds you up And he sets you apart, making you holy and sacred again. Now, he did this first in your baptism, when he claimed you as his own, covering you with his purity, setting you apart as his child. And he does it every time that forgiveness is pronounced to you, building you back up out of the ashes, restoring you to your status as being set apart for him. He does it when he dwells with you in the temple of his body and blood, in the sacrament, in the divine service. And even when the temple of your body has been destroyed, when death has done its absolute worst and you've died, he'll still raise you back up. He'll call you by name and you'll be raised, resurrected, never to be defiled or torn down again. You'll have eternal life with him, holy and set apart for eternity, marked with his own name as the one with whom he desires to dwell for all time. Jesus gives you his holiness in place of your unholiness. That means that even now, at this moment, you're set apart. You're not common. You don't belong to the world. Yes, you may have dealings with it, as we all do, but that's only out of necessity to support this body and life. But you don't belong to it. You're not every day You're set apart. You're holy. You're his. You're dedicated for his own purposes, made known to you as your life unfolds in the places where he's set you, as you're destined for an eternity with him. Because he was torn down and raised up again for you, you belong to him, marked as his child, designated to live with him forever. In the name of Jesus, who sets us apart as holy. Amen. During this season of Lent, it's appropriate for us to revisit the basic tenets of the faith